Everyone has a story. I get them to tell it. Welcome to the Aaron Bender Podcast, conversations with media personalities about their personal and professional lives and journeys. Thank you so much for your support, whether you're watching on YouTube, IGTV, or streaming nightly at 11 p.m. Pacific, 2 a.m. Eastern at dbnatelevision.tv or the DBNA TV app on Amazon Fire, Roku, or Apple TV, or listening on your favorite platform. Before we get to my conversation with Sharon Tay, a little about my story. I'm a widowed dad of two girls who just lost their mom, a grieving husband, a man in recovery trying to reconnect with the world with fresh eyes, faith, and perspective, a college journalism professor, a white guy in a world of injustice, a 20-year broadcast media veteran who had his dream job and then lost it. Nearly two years ago, God gave me a gift, an opportunity to stop, step back, and breathe so I can learn about love, vulnerability, forgiveness, grace, self-care, patience, and understanding. Sharon Tay spent 30 years in TV news, most of it in Los Angeles at KTLA and CBS until she was swept up in last year's layoffs. She's taken that opportunity to pivot to her passion, real estate. Your journey starts in Singapore. Yes, I was born in Singapore. And um, when I was seven, I, I moved to the United States. I, I moved to New York. I immigrated so, to New York. Yeah. Are you are you Singaporean? I mean, yes. okay, okay. Yeah. I've I've been to Singapore once. It's been a long oh. time. It's been about a decade or so. Okay. And, I mean, tell me, tell me if you feel like my my assessment is correct in that Singapore is everything LA could have been and should have been had they done everything right. Right. <laughs> I mean, That's you've right. got the beach, you've got the transportation, you've got the industry, you've got the, the lifestyle. Yeah, it's, it's truly, but it's much more of a metropolis than, than LA. You know, I mean, we're talking a smaller peninsula, you know, it's a small, it's a city that's, that's very, um, it's, it's very, uh, it's, there's, how do I say this? It's it's more cosmopolitan than LA. Yeah, yeah, that's more. true. That's yeah, true. Much more. So um, when you think about your childhood, where do those memories take you to Singapore, to New York, uh, where, uh, to the, to, I think to the Philippines for a time, right? As well. Yeah, that was a short time. Um, so I have lived pretty much all uh, a lot uh, all over the world uh, or traveled there. Um, ever since I was young. So when I think of my childhood, it depends. Um, my dog's going to bark in a second. Okay. It's all right. So. It's okay. That's all real life. It's fine. We leave it all in. Okay, good. Um, when I think of my childhood, when I was younger than seven, I think of Singapore, the night markets, um, the food stay, you know, stalls. Oh, the hawkers food. markets. Are... Hawkers market. You call it hawkers, but now they call it the night markets, you know. Oh, the night markets. Okay, we've, we've advanced a little bit. Yes. Um, and I think they're fancier. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Instead of sitting on an old drum, you sit on actually sit on a bench or something <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to yeah. eat food. Um, so that's what I think of. I think of, um, I think of powdered milk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think of... Um, just going swimming at the island club, things like that. Um, when I come to the United States, I think of like cow's milk. <laughs> yeah. I think of flying in and seeing the Statue of Liberty into New York. You, you do remember that. Okay, I was gonna ask, <laughs> what, what do you remember <laughs> about your move to the US? Yeah, as I was on the plane with my father and my family, my father looked out the window. I remember him hovering over me as we looked out the window as we were making the descent to to uh, either Kennedy or LaGuardia. I can't remember, but um, he said, "You know, that's the Statue of Liberty." And and he said to me, "He goes, we are now in the you know in in America," and it was such a moment. You know, I was only seven then. It was such a moment because it meant so much. It really did. It was truly extraordinary because before I moved to um, the States, everyone in Singapore was like, oh, you're going to America. You're going to America. Wow. It was just, it, there was such a, a luminescence with America, you know, and you're so fortunate to, to be going there. And yeah. And so when I arrived, I, 
remember moving into Manhattan and saying, oh my God, this is like a completely different world. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, I tried my first McDonald's hamburger when I first came here and it was just, it was really cool. <laughs> you know, everything, all the American culture was cool. You, you know, you, you kind of, you put a child into a situation where it's like, okay, we're going to take you out of the only home, you know, and we're going to move you into a new place. But it sounds like everybody, including your family painted this picture of, oh no, where we're going is going to be awesome. Yeah. And, and you embrace that. No doubt. I mean, I was so young. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Um, but my father came because he was in international business and his company, uh, which was in Singapore, also had a comp uh, an office, I think it was based or headquartered in New York, in Manhattan okay. at the time. And that's why he was transferred from Singapore to, I'm sorry, from Singapore to um, the States. Well, that's the only way you can afford to live in Singapore, really, is work for <laughs> a, a, a foreign company, work for like a, a, an American company with an office in Singapore. That's, yeah. that's like the goal. That would be amazing. Yeah. That would be amazing. Singapore is very expensive oh, uh, man. now, but I mean, back then it wasn't, you know, it's like Singapore and Hong Kong are, yeah. are they, they always vie for like the most expensive place to live in the world. Yeah. In the world. It truly is. Um, and, and it's just, but extraordinary, beautiful places. How was it growing up in New York? What, what, what are some things that you remember? Well, I remember, um, watching TV. Um, and seeing an Asian journalist on television and my father saying, oh my gosh, look, there's, there's an Asian there, Well, at that point we were calling Oriental at the point we were like, oh, there's an Oriental anchor news anchor. And I said, yeah, you know, I was so young. I didn't know any, any, any better. And, um, and I remember that kind of stuck in my mind and, and just seeing Orientals or Asians in America was just a, a cool thing. I felt like I wasn't alone. You know, we we're like, yeah, there are our people here in America. It was, you know, it was wow. I mean, just again, that idea of you embrace the idea and then you get here and you feel embraced as well. You feel like, wow, I, I, there's some representation. Yeah. There, there were a lot of Asian people. I felt, I felt comfortable, you know, I felt really comfortable. Um, I, I, we traveled a lot within the States, you know, we went to Colorado, we went to uh, we, my father really took us around the states to see America, and and it was to experience culture. That's what my my father was always terrific about that. Experience culture, whether it's um, domestically here in the states or, or worldwide. We've always traveled and, and immersed ourselves, and that was really a valuable life lesson. You know, it's interesting that I ask you about your you know your your childhood memories in New York, and you immediately go to what would eventually be your job as well. Yeah. And, and perhaps you are, uh, you know, seen by a little boy or girl who is looking, wow. Okay. Wow. There's, there's somebody who, who looks like me on TV. At what point did you feel like that's what you wanted to pursue? That was, yeah, that was your calling. I, um, went to a uh, boarding school in Massachusetts and for junior and senior year. And um, the, my English teacher said, boy, you really have a great voice. You should be a DJ. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. And I was like, you know, it was junior year of high school. And, and I was like, okay, it sounds, you know, and I was like, okay. And I, that's kind of like, was another signal, you know, it was yeah. like another signal that was kind of sent to me like a calling. And, um, and I decided to pursue, well, then I was like teetering when I was, it was time to apply for college teetering between applying as a journalism major or um, in something in the international arena, like political science. So when I graduated, I applied to different schools and um, decided to major in, and I got into BU, I got into Georgetown because Georgetown had a really strong international law program that I was really inter interested in, international relations program. So I decided to go to BU because I made that my major. My broadcasting was my major. This is a very well-known broadcasting school. Um, majored in that and then minored in international relations at BU. And, that's and, how and I, it, it sounds a lot like, of course, your dad had a lot of influence there, or at least mm -hmm. uh, maybe not said, okay, you, you need to also 
you know, uh, uh, major in international relations, but the idea of, wow, you're, you're seeing him and you're seeing the lifestyle he leads in, in terms of being able to travel the world. Yeah, that looks pretty interesting too. Yeah, that would really, I mean, it, it's always been second nature. I mean, when I came to the States, I had an English accent, you know, uh, cause in Singapore we were, um, we were occupied by the British. When I say occupied, it sounds so warlike, but it's not, but it was run by the British. It was, yeah, it was a British colony. Yeah, yeah, the British still. colony. And so we were educated in the British school system. So when I came here, I had an English accent. So I was very, you know, worldly at the time, when even from young. Um, but my dad didn't have any say in, in terms of my broadcasting career. He wanted me, like all Asian dads, wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist. <laughs> I did not. And then when I told him about what I was going to do, he's like, okay, yeah, whatever, you know, and lo and behold, it started how, doing this. How, how did you convince him that, that, that would be okay? That, that, you know what, it's, you know, it, dad, it, it, it's going to be okay. My dad never, I didn't never, I never had to convince him. This is my dog. Hi. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I never wow, that is a huge dog. No, he, he, he's, he's a big black lab. He's crazy. Uh, I never had to convince him. I think it was just like, whatever makes you happy, do it, you know, as long as it makes you happy. And I loved um, broadcasting because I loved the technical aspect of it and the writing of telling stories. And, you know, I love to write and I was such a creative thinker at the time when I was young. And and so I, that's how I, I got into it. And I just, you know, I'm going to pursue it. I, I felt like uh, I, I was also told high school, college, oh, you've got a great voice. You should do this, that, or the <laughs> other. But it, it never really, I never really put two and two together until for me, business didn't work out. Like I went to Mount Sac for a few years. I was going to transfer to Cal State Fullerton on a business degree. And uh -huh. I was falling asleep in economics classes and accounting <laughs> yeah. classes. I'm like, okay, well, this is not for me if I'm doing this at the JC. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I, I decided to switch gears and uh, went into a couple of radio classes at the, the junior college level and just fell in love, absolutely fell in love. And then I kind of learned that storytelling aspect of it. But it sounds like um, you, you had that background already, that storytelling background already. Um, at, at what point uh, while you're at BU do you feel like, okay, this absolutely was the right decision? Um, freshman, I was more goal oriented because this is what I, that's what I wanted to do. So um, when I was in class in broadcasting, broadcasting school, I really was so bored because <laughs> back then it wasn't practical. What they were teaching was everything was very theoretical. Oh, it's all theoretical. And, and yes. Historical. So I was like, I don't care about yellow journalism. I yeah. care about now. <laughs> I care about teach me how to do this now. That's what I wanted to learn. So I would go to class, almost fall asleep. Yeah. And, but then I knew, I found a cable company that did news, a small broadcast, and it was located in the school and it was run by students, yet there was a, a, a more, it was an anchor that was more experienced, you know, he was, he was grown up. <laughs> and so was the news director, he was grown up, and an assignment editor who was a graduate student. And I walked in there at fresh, fr during freshman year, and after, literally after two weeks after school started, and I said, teach me how to do this. And they couldn't accommodate me as an intern because I wasn't old enough. You know, you had to be a junior and senior to qualify. Oh, for okay. Junior program. So I said, I'll volunteer, I'll work, I'll sweep floors, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, I just, I just want to learn how to do this. And I said, how to do this, as opposed to, I want to learn journalism. No, just teach me how right. to do this. I can learn journalism at, uh, at school in the classes yeah. I'm falling asleep in. Here, right. I want to learn how to be a broadcaster. Yeah, I want to be a broadcaster. I want to learn how to write. That's, that was the key. Yeah. So they didn't hire me. I just volunteered. For just the kept first. showing up and they're like, I kept fine, showing fine, up fine. and I, I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this. <laughs> and um, they, at that point we had typewriters and we were, you know, transcribing or not transcribing because that would be plagiarism. Um, we would take news articles we would create a for, formulate, uh, create a newscast. Repurpose, repurpose. Repurpose. That's, that's yeah. the word that I throw out there. Yes, I'm repurposing. But, writing, you know, writing, uh, writing broadcast VOs, voiceovers um, from long articles. It took me six hours to, to do a story. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> that started. That sounds and about then, right. Right. And then now I'm like, ah, you know, no problem. It was just like, <laughs> ah, as you get more experience, you just get, get quick faster at it. You mentioned that you were very goal oriented. What was the goal? Because as I left college, I was like, okay, two to three years in my first market, that was Fresno. Three to five years in my second market, that was Miami. And then I wanted to get back to LA. And yeah. that's what ended up happening. Did you leave college with a specific goal in mind? Yes, that I wanted to be a, a, a news broadcaster. It didn't, it didn't matter where. It didn't, didn't matter where or, or anything where. like that. Just, okay. It was a journey. And I took it step by step. And not because I wanted to be on TV or it wasn't because I wanted to be, I wanted fame and all that that comes with it. It was more, I like to tell stories and I love the technical aspects and how to put together a story and seeing it air. You know, that's, that's really cool. Um, so all through college, I learned how to write, produce, direct, edit. We edit, we edited on three quarter inch decks. Yes. Do you yes. remember those? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So I learned how to edit. I love the whole process of it. And, um, when I graduated, I could get, they would, they would allow me to be in front of the camera. Cause when you were in school, you weren't allowed to be in front of the camera. Oh, okay. Yes. So by the time, yeah. So by the time I graduated, I knew how to do everything behind the scenes. I even produced my own weekend show and all I had to learn was how to be on camera. And that was a huge, that was another huge mountain to climb because that's a completely, you know, different aspect of, of journalism, broadcast journalism. So, yeah. And that's how you get your first job. Was that out in California? Yeah. So I, you shop your tape around and, and you shop your resume around the first, um, offer I got was from Monterey in Monterey, California with a CBS affiliate. Not a bad place I, to start. No, it was better than, I'm sorry, but better than <laughs> Idaho. Yes. Better than, yes. Right? So I ended up going, I, I flew out to, to Monterey. I bought a car when I got off the plane, a little Mazda 323, what I could, could afford for $187 a month. It was the payment on it. I remember. <laughs> and I, uh, flew to San Jose, bought the car, drove to Monterey, California, and started my life here in California. Yeah. Did you think at that point, or even envision at that point, that you would eventually spend 90% of your career here? No. Like I said, my it was the journey, you know, it was just going on this journey and seeing where, where it took me. It didn't matter where I was going. It was just matter that it mattered what I was doing. You know, as long as I was doing what I loved, that was the most important thing. That uh, said, did you feel like, wow, okay, Monterey straight to KTLA? Uh, yeah, that was a huge jump. Okay, so huge. the magnitude of it, you you understood that at at that yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, when my agent said, you know, you're moving from 110 market to number two, I was like, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, you know, and, and, and when I came down here, I realized the magnitude and the history, you know, the history, uh, the value of it here in Los Angeles to be a journalist here in Los Angeles at that age. And I was maybe 25, 26 at the time. That was young. Field reporter or anchor? I was hired. a field reporter. Okay. Yeah. You remember your first live shot? No, I probably <laughs> messed it up. <laughs> You're like, no, I blocked that out. <laughs> <laughs> there are many times that I've blocked it. I've blocked out many things, um, but it was just truly. I mean, I was my mentor at the time was Stan Chambers. You know, oh, not a and, wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. it was cool because I remember my first week in LA, and I went out with him as a as a reporter. Um, to, to, I went out on stories with him and just I kind of get the lay of the land, shadow him. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just so cool because he's the, the kindest, gentlest human being I'd ever met, you know, and, and, um, and then realized the history involved with his history in, in LA as a journalist and the stories that he covered was truly remarkable, you know, and then working with Larry McCormick, amazing, Hal Fishman, he was always so kind, you know, and, and so, so helpful. Gosh, I can only imagine that first live shot where Hal throws it to you in the in the sure. ten o'clock news. Oh my gosh, I'm just I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about You're that. Right? It's just like Sharon. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to talk now. Well, I also came down, and when I think one of my first live shots were was um, the fires in Malibu a long time ago. Um, 
Pepperdine was on fire. It was behind me. And, and I remember going out and covering that and, oh my God, I didn't even know what North, South, East and West was. So it was asking me where, where the direction of this fire, where's it going? Uh, <laughs> that way. It's going that way. <laughs> I was like, uh, I, you know, I was like, quick, get out the map. It's like smoke and soot. And I had a bandana around my face and it was, it was truly an experience. You know, it really was. Uh, crossing town then to go to two and nine. Okay. Um, so it, yeah, <laughs> in between I, I spent, um, I went to the morning show uh on the ktla oh yes that's know, right that's Richardson. right they just they just celebrated uh an anniversary recently yeah, their 30th anniversary. You, yeah. yeah and uh i went to the morning show i was better suited for the morning show because of my personality and i was young and it was just i, I had a lot of personality when i was growing up and uh, when i was growing up and uh worked on the morning show as the um early edition anchor um i think it was between 5 30 and 7 Seven to nine was the main show. I did the early edition with um, Emmett Miller. And I did, and I was a reporter and I do all kinds of funny things with Sam on, on the morning show. The morning show then was, you know, I would say revolutionary. You know, it just put morning shows. Oh, totally. Map, right? Yes. And print journalists couldn't handle it. They thought we weren't serious journalists. Well, guess who had the last laugh, you know? Yeah. So, so they would, there was always a, you know, butting of the heads. Um, we did something, it was bold, it was taking a risk, but it worked because it, it, so many people watched and it became the most popular morning show in, in LA and was the model for morning shows to come nationwide. Yeah, so, just the idea that it didn't have to originate from New York. That you, don't, yeah. you didn't have to sign off at seven o'clock to go watch something that is three hours old and all and 3000 miles away. Right. And also the format too. I mean, the format was much more laxed. You know, we, yeah. we, we showed our personality. We weren't just talking heads. We didn't deliver the news. We shared the news with you, you know, and on a more personable level. And that was the whole, that's, I think one of the many things that made it successful and extraordinary was that we talked to people and they got to know us as as people, not as just journalists, but as people. And they trusted us. A couple of years, that, oh, yeah. go ahead. And then after that, I spent, um, I wanna say 11 years with KTLA as a whole. And um, then I got a job at MSNBC in New York uh, for a very short time. So they approached me with um, hosting two entertainment shows. An offer you couldn't refuse, okay. basically. An offer I couldn't yeah. refuse because I needed to go home. There was a reason why um, I took a lot of heat from you know, the LA Times specifically from a couple of the writers uh, for being who I was. And it got real bad. And what, do you, what do you mean, like being who you were? Meaning like I just tried, because I was myself, they just thought I was just a pretty talking. I just, I remember uh, they did an article on newscasters in LA and I, they pulled myself and Lauren Sanchez up and they said, are they hiring newscasters because of their looks? And it decimated my, my, it just hurt a lot. You know, I got hurt and it was something that it was really tough to get over because it really shook my, my confidence and it was really bad. And uh, because of the kind of show I did, I did a lot of like we did skits, we did routines, you know, and then we, yeah. we did stories and we made them very entertainment oriented. Well, you know, real journalists aren't supposed to be that way or look this way or, you know, um, act this way. So anyway, uh, long story short, after that, I just, when I got the offer at MSNBC, I wanted to go back East. I need to get out of LA for a while and, and be home because that was where my family was, where mm -hmm. my roots. So I worked for MSNBC for two uh, for their two entertainment shows as their host, and then after six months, the show was canceled. Um, it didn't work, and I knew that. You know, I took the risk because I really wanted to work for Rick Kaplan. Rick Kaplan uh, was the one who created um, Nightline, you know, and he ran MSNBC. And he's extremely well known in the journalism profession. 
uh, especially in New York on the national level. And he had took me in under his wing and he, and he said, why don't you do these, do these shows for me? It's entertainment. And after six months, um, that show, those shows were canceled. Um, I took about a year and a half off just to chill and decided I, I needed to move back to California and moved back to California and started actually entertained going into some doing to doing something else like real estate. I yeah, just to just getting else. out. Of yeah, I was thinking of getting out of the business because at that point it had been 16 years in the business and I was thinking of getting out. But then um, I had a, a nice meeting with CBS and KCAL and yeah. they wanted to hire me. And I said, OK, I'm going to give this a shot, you know. 13 years later, you know, um, it ends and here I am in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk a lot about mental health on the podcast and, oh. you know, you, you've got that year and a half break between yeah. the short stint and MSM at MSNBC and going to uh, CBS here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds as if, especially with the, the hit that you took even before going to New York, it sounds as if that year and a half was transformational for you. You needed that to kind of reconnect with yourself and who you were and what you wanted. Yeah, I needed to find myself again and 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 sort of, you know, the experience I love working for KTLA was fun, but this is before, you know, bullying was, you know, um, highlighted. People recognize what that is, you know, and and we're not talking about bullying in the workplace. We're just talking about bullying from like just haters, you know, who- Right, it, it sounds hate. as if this, this yeah. was uh, not, it's not the early days of Twitter, but it yeah. sounds like if Twitter yeah. was around, that's what it would look like. Yeah, yeah. And it was just really, it was, it was bad. And um, I needed to find myself because I remember my mother saying to me when I moved back East, she goes, why? She goes, my friends are talking about you. And then she looked at me and she said, why do people, so many people hate you, you know? And when I said, and I said, I don't know why, you know, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, I don't know why. And I, I didn't know why, you know? And, and I kind of needed that time to um, heal from all that pain. It was, it was a lot. What was that conversation like with, with your mom? I mean, hearing those words come out of her mouth. Oh, it, it hurt, you know, it just broke me. I, I was like, my family thinks I'm being hated. I'm trying to make a living and trying to do my best, um, learning what I can from people and the, the business and trying to do my best. And it just, there were, I, the haters really took a lot out of me. And, and when my mom said that, you were like, wow, you know, she's on the East coast and right. You know, and she's hearing this because it was all over the internet supposedly. And it was after that time when the internet was just getting started, you know, right. people reading all the stuff about you, you know, all these bad articles that were written about you for no reason at all. It's not like you did anything bad. Um, and I just needed that time. I needed a time to clear my head and focus on what, and I really wanted to leave the business you know, and not come back ever again. Yeah, I mean, that that's at a time when now, again, we're talking about on this podcast, mental health is a, a running theme. Oh, yeah. But at that time, no, you, you didn't let on that something could break you. You didn't let on that something is, is hurting you or, or that you need to recover from something. You didn't, you didn't yeah. let on because as journalists, no, you needed to be uh, on, on point. all the time. <laughs> On point all the time. You can't, and it wasn't cool to let your, you know, let the skeletons or the uh, the the negativity out. You know, right. you, you people couldn't see you were suffering in here. You know, in your heart, uh, it just wasn't cool to 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 share that. You know, with people. So you had to kind of pick yourself up and dust the dust yourself off and and move on. And and builds and that's how the strength built. Your inner strength starts to to build, and your and resilience, you know, starts to build. You talk about you know you were part of uh, the KTLA Morning News, yeah. ushering in uh, a new era in yeah. morning television. And I yeah. feel also like you are uh, one of the pioneers in terms of making fashion part <laughs> of broadcast journalism. You know, I don't. You know, it's so funny. I don't purposely, I have a, I love fashion. Don't get me wrong. I love fashion, 
but I love, you know, I, I, there's a style that I have that I like to follow. It's just very simple. You know, it's not complicated, <laughs> you know, it's just, I, I just, I, I never thought of it as like, oh, as myself as uh, uh, let's put myself on a, uh, on a, on this, this um, platform of right. showing what I have to wear. I just, I literally pull from my closet. <laughs> I mean, we don't have stylists. It wasn't that. Yeah. Our clothes weren't paid for. I had to go sh buy my clothes. And I just love that creativity and, and what I have and how I can put something together. Yeah. I just, so I just you. remember there was like, uh, uh, I mean, thinking back to one of the Oscars, there was a red dress or something like that. That yeah. I that that I I feel like honestly, if we looked at all the different coverage of all the different award shows mm -hmm. before and since, that was I I feel like that was a moment. Thank you. That red dress was I don't even I forgot who made it. I bought it. I don't know who made it. Who the designer was, but I covered the Elton John party with that dress on, and I remember. Um, yeah, it felt so good. It was different. <laughs> It felt good because I was like a little bit of cleavage, you know, I, I wasn't trying to be sexy. I just love that style. I love that fashion. Yeah, yeah it know? was just the idea that uh, journalists could also be part of the show. You know, it, it wasn't it wow. wasn't just like, OK, all the fashion needs to be on the red carpet. Then uh, us oh. over here, we're just we're, we're dressing down because we're working. No, you know? we're just you know, normal people <laughs> that love clothes, <laughs> that love like I'm a woman first. You know, and I'm I'm a woman. I'm I do have parts. parts. <laughs> yes, parts. You know, yes, women have legs. They like to show their legs. You know, it's not anything trying to. Yeah, for me at least, it wasn't trying to be like trying to be sexy. I think a woman has to be is is sexy when she's not trying to be sexy. You know, and so that's that's how I just I've always been that way. It's not trying to be anything I'm not. You know what I mean? So uh, you talked about your time at Channel 2 last yeah. year, caught up in the layoffs that were company-wide. Does yeah. that make it easier or more difficult? Like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna take it personally because it was layoff, but at the same time, I just lost my job. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when they told me, I was like, what, what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, huh? And I, you know, I, I just kind of like, I was shocked when the shock wore after after three days. I don't get angry. You know, I wasn't angry. I'm not a bitter person. I'm like, it's time to pivot. Yeah. Time to pivot. Okay. So um, I said, I'm, I'm in the middle of a pandemic, mind you. It's not just I, pivoting, yeah. but yeah. yeah, in the middle of a pandemic where um, no one was hiring, the world came to a full stop, you know. Yeah. So I use that time to say, I'm gonna go follow my second passion and that's real estate. And what do, I, what do I do? I have all this time, so I'm gonna study, okay? Make that time useful and study. And that's what I did. I, I, I started studying real estate and um, learned a lot. And I use that time to learn in between Zoom workouts. <laughs> okay i mean uh, and, and i took that isolation as a chance to grow myself you know expand my knowledge compare if you could so you've got that year and a half off between msnbc and uh returning to southern california and then you've got this other break here mm -hmm. between being laid off from cbs and mm -hmm. starting this career in real estate Compare those two times in your life because those are these Pivotal. breaks that will define the next decade. No doubt. And I'm glad you said that because back then it was just like, I went to Europe literally and just bummed around <laughs> last year. I mean, that was when I was in my 30s, I want to say. Yeah, my 30s. Yeah, my late 30s. I, it was a different mindset. Then I just needed to break. You know, I just needed to break not comb my hair, not put on makeup, um, go ride on a motorcycle for, for days, you know, or spend it on the beach in Europe somewhere. You know, I was in Greece at the time. And um, I didn't think about the next step. I really didn't. And I should have, you know, but I didn't. I just, just did it. I just needed. Well, you weren't that. in a place to really think about what's next because you, no. you know, you, 
you've got this chapter that you just left behind KTLA and MSNBC yeah. where it almost broke you. Yeah, it broke me. Um, spiritual, I need to sort of mend myself. I needed to, I needed to focus on, on healing, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, so then when I left there, when I, and then I went to CBS and when after this, the, the difference between going back is the CBS, when I got laid off of CBS, I'm 50 something years old, okay? I have a lot more wisdom, you know? I'm a lot smarter, um, I'm a lot more mature, you know? I'm a different person than I was when I was in my late thirties. And I knew that I needed to build something and do something else if I'm gonna make a pivot I'm gonna to have to focus and, and really concentrate on it. And that's why I was just like, boom, let's hit the books, let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. <laughs> I'm did, not gonna, you know. I'm did it take you back to be you? Mm -hmm. like, like just the idea of cracking open these books and-, and Yeah, it did. And going in to, to Berkshire Hathaway and saying, you know, I'm gonna be, I, I'm gonna have my license soon. And I, I walked in before I, before I got my license, I, approach them and and I was so grateful for them to say yes welcome welcome come work for us come you know that's come cool license with us you have no it was just been when they did their support has just been enormous and it made me feel it's really touched me in so many ways um because of my history you know it was a welcoming place it's been a welcoming place and 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 I look forward to working with them what has it been like this market is just absolutely <laughs> crazy it's yeah. so crazy. crazy what has it been like entering this and i'm sure you've talked with a bunch of your colleagues at berkshire hathaway about yeah. Yeah, you know yeah. this obviously this this housing market is not like uh, you know the last 5 10 15 years yeah. uh what have those conversations been like and how does it feel for you going into this market it, well it's scary going into it but exciting at the same time you know so exciting it's um it's Finding out that the market is, you know, everyone's saying it's a seller's market, and indeed it is a seller's market. Um, is there a slight correction? Yeah, there's. It's it's starting to correct itself a bit, you know. Um, so that's the kind of market I'm facing, where it's it's not. I want to. I don't want to say tapering off, but it's just it's mellowing out a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So, it's not quite alpine steep. Yeah, it's but it's not. still maybe. <laughs> maybe the, uh, you know, maybe the Rockies, you know, right, so, so. Right, right, right. So, I mean, the interest rates are great. It's a good time to buy. It's a good time to you know, sell, but if you price your, your house just right, um, a lot of homeowners, um, tend to overprice, you know, their agents and them they tend to overprice, um, and are finding that their homes are sitting on the market and not getting as much as they want for it, you know, at, at so. a time when homes don't sit on the market. Yeah, you know, five to 10 days, I'm sure is probably right. the average for a properly priced home. Yes, but now it's it's tapering off, you know, it's just I think everyone's just calming down. And, and we're seeing that correction where it is sitting on the market, people buyers are, are hesitating a little bit more, you know, just waiting a little little longer again. So we'll, we'll see how it goes, you know, it's like the stock market up and down, up and down. I've got but, real um, estate agents con uh, contacting me and say, Hey, do you want to sell? Do you want to sell? And I was like, yeah. Well, I've, I've thought about it because yeah, let's take advantage of these prices, but I then know. to get into the next home, it's going to, it's going to be quote overpriced or it's going to be a, an elevated price unless I downsize right. and I'm not in a position to downsize. Yeah, no, I think that you can get into a house without, without paying over, you know, the uh, well, over too much for it, I should right. say. I think yeah. you can get to a house that's priced just right if you work with the right agent. Hello. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Sharon Tay of Berkshire Hathaway. No, um, I, I think I, you just have to work with an agent that is um, reasonable with your needs and knows how to price it right for the market. And you know what? We're, you can always take it off the market if it doesn't work out, yeah. right? You can give it a shot. I say, give it a shot. I say, I say, list it, give it a shot, see what kind of nibbles you get and, and see if it works for you. Those numbers work for you. And if you want to move somewhere else, you think about like what you want, what's your dream, you know, and then work towards that dream and achieving your, your goals. And the idea also that, especially with the pandemic, it's shown that people can kind of, for many jobs, live anywhere. 
yeah. and still do their job. And so you've got a lot of people leaving LA to, you know, go to Tennessee or go to yeah. Idaho, uh, go to, go to Texas. Texas. Yes. Oh yeah. Nashville is so hot right now. I know. I know. I know. And Texas is too. I have some real estate friends in Houston. Oh my gosh. They're doing so well. Um, because a lot of um, people have moved just transplants, right? Yeah, Moving from LA, but, um, you know, things will bounce back. And I think it's, it's a great market, a great time to get into the market right now. Um, and just see what you can, and, and, and you know, don't lose sight of your dreams, never lose sight of your dreams. And if you downsize, so what downsize, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we learn to live. One thing is just, I've learned over the years is that you can learn to live simply. You can downsize, but not necessarily downgrade. Okay. Oh, well done. Yes. I like that. Right? I like that. That's how I, I, I apply it to my life. I can downsize, but I don't want to downgrade. Yeah. So less is more. Just think of it that way. Yes. Right. How did you deal with the, um, the, the, the company kind of taking your identity away as a, a, as a news anchor, as a broadcast journalist, or did you get to the point mentally where you're like, you know, that's not my identity. It's just my job. Um, I've always known that, you know, I've always known that because I was, again, going back to KTLA, I did a show where you needed to be transparent as a, as a human being, you know, you had, to, what worked was being transparent because people loved it and they trusted it. It trusted you for it. You know, they don't feel like there was a wall between you. They felt like you were much more approachable. That's always been, that's always been my motto. It's always been my style, you know, of journalism um, to be as real as possible, you know, and, and, and professional at the same time. It's always I think we power. just found our promo clip right there. Let me mark the tape 4310 <laughs> promo clip. Perfect. All right, good. <laughs> um, how can people contact you if they want to sell their home or they need somebody to help them find a home? Okay. Um, you can go to my website, Sharon Tay, T-A-Y-R-E dot com. You can go to my website and um, just reach out to me on that contact form and I'll get back to you. Very cool. Good luck to you. I, I love this. I, I want to say second career, but it sounds like it's just it's you're grabbing onto a passion that's always been there and you finally have the the, the time and the yeah. mental space really and yeah. and just the place in your life to do it. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that um, you're constantly evolving. And we as human beings are constantly evolving. And you have and, and sometimes the evolution could be scary, you know, no doubt. I mean, it's scary because you're doing something completely different from what you, you know and what you've done for so many years. Um, but it's also growth that is extraordinary growth as a human being. I feel so much smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, just the idea, of... like, like, here we are. Wait, wait a minute. I can learn something new. Yeah. I can learn, you know, a, a completely new career. Mm -hmm. that's it's huge not, it's not too late um i'm willing to try it you know we'll see what happens if i fall down i'll get get back up dust myself off move to spain and just sit on a beach shack and drink <laughs> something wine all day but, going back um, to uh, not gonna brush my hair not gonna yeah, do no, this right, yeah. put makeup on or like that but you know give it a shot why not you know i i want to i want to end knowing that I can be something else other than what I was for so many years and do something I'm passionate about. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Aaron Bender podcast, whether it's on YouTube, IGTV, or nightly at 11 p.m. Pacific or 2 a.m. Eastern on DBNA TV at dbnatelevision.tv. You can contact me, all my social media, aaronbender.com. Email me guest ideas or comments. AaronBenderMedia at gmail.com. Be well and thanks for watching.